All right, I'll go ahead and get us started then. Uh, first of all, hello and welcome to the MCHRI seminar series. I'm Elizabeth Bergener, I'm an instructor in pediatric pulmonary medicine, and I'll be your moderator for today's seminar. Before I introduce our speakers, I do have a few slides to go over. Um, first, I'm, uh, our MCHRI Education Committee um, organizes this seminar series. I'm a member of it, hence why I'm moderating today. We've had a couple people from our committee move on to um, faculty jobs elsewhere, so we have a couple new faces up there. And then our MCHRI annual report um, is now out. You can um, see some of the impressive statistics about MCHRI, including the $10 million of funding that was provided last year. And you can see in those nice pie charts there in the middle, the kind of multidisciplinary types of research that um, the MCHRI supports. And then our upcoming seminars in January, we have Stephen Montgomery and Matthew Wheeler, who will be talking about the detection of uh, undiagnosed diseases. And then in February, we have Natalie, Natalia Gomez Ospina and Pascalina Colella um, presenting on engineering hemopoietic stem cells um, to treat non-hematologic diseases. And with that, I'll move on to introducing today's speakers. <clears throat> And you'll have to excuse my voice. I got some non-COVID um, illness from my children <laughs> this weekend. Um, but for today, we have uh, Dr. Leah Stephens and Dr. Maya Kumar, who will be speaking about single-cell approaches to understanding neo-intimal lesions um, in pulmonary hypertension. And Dr. Leah Stephens is an instructor in uh, the Department of Pediatrics and Pulmonary Medicine, um, who, in addition to her pulmonary training, has completed a pulmonary hypertension fellowship within our PEDS cardiology department. Dr. Steffes is a Wisconsin native who moved to California in 2017 for her pulmonary fellowship, at which point she joined the lab of Dr. Maya Kumar to study the mechanisms of pulmonary hypertension. And since finishing fellowship, she's continued here as an instructor to continue her research and is currently supported by the Stanford Pediatrics Bridge Decay Program. And Dr. Maya Kumar is an assistant professor also in the Department of Pediatrics Division of Pulmonary Medicine. She completed her PhD at Harvard working on embryonic stem cells and then moved to um, Stanford to do a postdoc in Dr. Mark Krasno's lab working on lung development prior to establishing her own lab here at Stanford where she's using molecular and genetic tools to understand vascular changes in pulmonary hypertension. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Steffes and Dr. Kumar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hold on, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, share and display. Please, please display. Okay, there we go. <laughs> all right. I hope everybody can see that. Shout if you can't see it. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present today. Leah and I, and here I'm going to move the screen so you can see Leah. Leah, yes. <laughs> Leah and I are um, we're delighted to be here. We're really happy to be able to share some of our work with you. And what we're going to tell you about today is um, some of our work on the fascinating problem of artery remodeling that drives um, disease progression in a disease called pulmonary hypertension. And we'll highlight the approaches that we've taken using a variety of technologies, both single cell and otherwise, to begin to unravel what has for many years been a fairly intractable problem. So first, a tiny bit of context that I, I hope is appropriate for the MCHRI audience. So my training, as Liz outlined, is as a developmental biologist. And the question that's always um, driven me is one of the central questions of developmental biology, which is how are cells coordinated to build tissues? Right, So identifying and characterizing the progenitor populations that build a tissue of interest, identifying the regulated steps in their recruitment to a particular lineage, understanding the molecular underpinnings of each of those steps, and understanding how the disparate events in organ development, in this case, um, the developing lung, they're coordinated to achieve the proper final pattern. So these are the kinds of things that we in this lab want to understand, but we are studying them not in the embryo anymore, but rather <clears throat> in this um, very profound artery remodeling that characterizes pulmonary hypertension, which is what I'm showing you here. So um, I hope to convince you that this transition from health to disease is a developmental process that can be interrogated at the single cell level using all those same tools of developmental biology. 
Okay, so pulmonary hypertension or pH, it's um, driven by a progressive remodeling of the pulmonary arteries in which healthy vessels, such as the one here on the left, um, transition to occluded vessels, such as the one shown here on the right. So um, these occluded vessels are surrounded by inflammation, including antibody producing tertiary lymphoid follicles. The smooth muscle media, which is indicated with that yellow bar, um, it thickens leading to um, much less plastic, um, stretchy um, arteries. And I think most remarkably, the lumen of the vessel becomes completely blocked by the formation of these so-called neointimal lesions, which are indicated with this blue bar here. So <clears throat> neointimal lesions are cellular accumulations that appear beneath the endothelium and which grow and grow and grow, ultimately blocking the lumen. And this increases the pulmonary vascular resistance that the right heart has to push against and that then leads to right heart failure and, and death. And despite intense study, treatment options for pH remain quite limited. Um, they're limited to pulmonary vasodilator therapies, which extend life, but which don't stop this relentless remodeling. So <clears throat> current pH therapies act by modifying the three main signaling pathways um, that <clears throat> uh, mediate signaling between the endothelium and the vascular smooth muscle cells. So those include the prostacyclin pathway, the nitric oxide pathway, and the endothelin pathway. And <clears throat> these lead to relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells, resulting in vasodilation. But these therapies don't specifically target vascular remodeling, um, and that uh, leads to limited um, effectiveness for uh, preventing and reversing disease. Okay, so what else? All right, so um, our goal in our lab is to try to understand the cells and the molecules, the basis for artery remodeling in pH for this transition from health to disease. And our goal is to find ways to halt lesion growth or even induce lesion regression. And so the questions we wanna ask are, what are the steps in this transition? How are those steps coordinated? How are they interdependent? How do progenitor cells contribute <clears throat> to these tissue expansions in disease and how are those progenitors regulated? And then which of those steps can be targeted pharmacologically to prevent or um, reverse disease? Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Leah. Okay, um, so identifying the cellular and molecular targets to inhibit or reverse the formation and growth of these abnormal neointimal lesions has really been very challenging um, because patient tissue is generally available only with end-stage disease. And the commonly used uh, murine models of pH, such as chronic hypoxia, don't make neointimal lesions. So based on this um, absence, um, we developed an improved model of pulmonary hypertension driven by perivascular inflammation. So in this model, uh, we expose the mice to the allergen house dust mite, uh, which will be abbreviated as HDM throughout the talk, uh, over a period of weeks. And even though the allergen is delivered via the airways, the animals actually sniff um, the HDM extract the inflammation transitions to being around the vessels within the first two days of exposure. And then following six weeks of inflammation, pulmonary arteries in the mouse, um, which is shown on the right here, show robust medial thickening um, and remarkable human-like neointimal lesions throughout the pulmonary vascular bed. So in this model, this impressive remodeling process happens following this very stereotyped and reproducible time course. With the media thickening during the first two weeks, the formation or seeding of those neointimal lesions um, at four weeks, and then rapid neointimal expansion occurring by six weeks. And this reproducible timing turns out to be very helpful experimentally, um, as you'll see throughout the remainder of the talk. So in these cross-sectional images of the vessels, um, the neointima appears to be made up of these small round cells, um, but as shown in the schematic, they're actually long thin cells um, that run parallel to the axis um, of the artery, um, mimicking what is seen in human neointimal lesions. So here um, I'm showing you a deep tissue staining of arteries in a pH patient, a stain to highlight the neointima in green. 
And in these small arteries, um, there are these long, thin neointimal cells running along the interior of the vessel in this very distinct orientation, very different from the vascular smooth muscle cells that wrap concentrically around the vessel. The reproducible timing of artery remodeling also makes it easy for us to quantitate vessel changes over time. So here, we're measuring the thickness of the smooth muscle media um, indicated um, on the top uh, by those magenta, magenta bars um, from confocal images after different durations of HGM exposure, where every vessel in this plot is a dot um, within the scatter plot. And as you can see, the media thickens um, entirely within the first two weeks of HGM exposure, and then that thickness holds steady thereafter. While neointima formation lags behind medial thickening, uh, forming between that two and four week window, and then rapidly expanding thereafter until by, um, until by eight weeks when 97% of the arteries contain neointima. And clearly visualizing the relative compartments of the remodeled arteries through our standardized immunohistochemistry vessel staining method really allows us to make these precise measurements um, from confocal images and, quant um, and quantitate large numbers of arteries over the course of the artery remodeling process. And this detailed analysis and quantitation lets us identify when specific events occur and gives us a way to precisely identify changes to the remodeling dynamics when we go ahead and perturb the system, for example, in genetically altered mice or when mice are treated with pathway modifying drugs. So now we have a system for deciphering the cellular and molecular basis of the neointimal lesion formation and, and growth in pH. Um, and with Maya's expertise, we have all the tools of mouse genetics at our disposal. So the first question we set out to answer was, where does the neointima come from? There are two main models in the field. One, that the smooth muscle cells from the media invade to form the neointima, or two, that the endothelial cells undergo an endothelial to mesenchymal transition. These models are uh, easily distinguishable using cell type specific lineage tracing in the mouse, um, here with an ACTA2 Cree ER um, to mark the smooth muscle, and a GJF5 Cree ER, also called Connexin 40, to mark the artery endothelium. So in both cases, the Cree ER is combined with a fluorescent Cree reporter. Um, and adult animals are given a saturating dose of tamoxifen to induce recombination. Um, and all daughter cells of the originally labeled population in each mouse will also carry um, that fluorescent lineage marker. We then expose the mice to HDM um, and the neointima forms. And then after eight weeks of exposure, the animals are harvested and we can look to see where the lineage mark has ended up. And as you can see here on the top, the neointima is lineage marked in red only when the smooth muscle cells are marked in the healthy animal and not when the endothelial cells are traced as shown below. So this result tells us that the neointimal cells arise from smooth muscle cells and not from the endothelium. So next, we really wanted to interrogate the cellular dynamics of neointimal growth and fully understand which vascular smooth muscle cells were contributing to both the formation and the growth of these neointimal lesions. So to answer this question, uh, we used a multicolor reporter mouse crossed with an inducible smooth muscle marker, and again gave a large saturating dose of tamoxifen to label the entire population of smooth muscle cells in a healthy mouse. So with this, um, as shown in the schematic, existing vascular smooth muscle cells are heritably labeled in healthy pulmonary arteries with a random pick of one of three colors, either ceruleum, M orange, or M cherry, which results in this random color distribution where cells of each of the three colors are now intermixed within the healthy media. And because all of the progeny of the originally labeled cells will now share its original fluorescent label color following HDM, if all of the vascular smooth muscle cells proliferate equally to thicken the media and form the neointima, then the distribution of colors in the newly formed cells will continue to have a random color distribution consistent with many cells undergoing a small number of divisions to form that thickened media and neointimal lesion. 
However, if only rare vascular smooth muscle cells proliferate to expand the media and form the neointima, then single color islands will appear in the newly formed tissue, which suggests there's a subpopulation of highly proliferative cells that give rise to the many labeled progeny. So what did we see? So here I'm showing an artery um, at the start of the experiment um, with the starting random colored distribution throughout the healthy media, medial smooth muscle cells. Then um, animals were exposed to HDM to induced artery remodeling. So first I'll show you our conclusions in both schematic form in schematic form first and then representative confocal images. So following medial expansion, the pattern remains essentially random, uh, which is consistent with many cells dividing a small number of times to thicken the media. And then in the next step, the seeding of the neointima, again, we see multiple colors in these small lesions, meaning multiple cells um, invade a local area to start lesion, um, lesion development. So this is a longitudinal view of an artery following three weeks of remodeling um, seen in a thick vibratome section. So um, I think you can see that the distribution of colors throughout the medial smooth muscle cells running around the arteries remains random. Um, and then underneath those cells running parallel to the axis of the artery are these small clusters of neointimal cells highlighted with these colored arrowheads. And cells within these clusters are composed of all three colors, meaning multiple individual smooth muscle cells dove in locally to found these clusters. And then, remarkably, during the period of neointimal expansion, where those small starting um, clusters become fully occlusive lesions, the pattern changes, and we see large bundles of single color neointimal cells filling the lumen. So this is consistent with a process of monoclonal expansion of a very few number of founder cells. Just a big slide, sorry. Um, so this again um, is a thick section with an oblique cut through a remodeled artery. And here, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, we see single color bundles of neointimal cells forming these occlusive lesions. So this tells us several important things. First, that the division of a handful of cells is responsible for growing these occlusive lesions. So if we can work harder to understand how those cells are selected and what drives that proliferative process, that's obviously of uh, gra great clinical interest to us. And secondly, um, and related, it suggests that the neointima doesn't expand by continued recruitment of new cells from the media. Rather, it suggests that those initial multicolored clusters that we saw are founder cells. They dive in to establish the neointima, and then that's it. No new cells come in, and those founders expand essentially in isolation. That bottleneck, where a small number of founders is selected, and then the door is closed after them, made us wonder whether there's some pre-pattern in healthy smooth muscle that determines which vascular smooth muscle cells would be selected to form the neointima, and whether we could identify those neointimal progenitors ahead of time uh, within the healthy animal. So NOTCH3 was an interesting candidate for the marker of the neointimal founder cells, as it has been implicated in maintaining an undifferentiated progenitor-like vascular smooth muscle cell state. Um, in addition, NOTCH3 protein expression is elevated in human PAH and in hypoxia-exposed mice, and it, NOTCH um, is also required for the rise in RVSP in mice, um, a measure, a, a hemodynamic measure of pulmonary hypertension um, seen in mice following hypoxia. Also, uh, when we looked at multiple single cell data sets, including one generated in our lab from both airway and vascular smooth muscle cell lineages, we saw that NOTCH3 expression was heterogeneous across the vascular smooth muscle cell cluster. So to assess the contribution of NOTCH3 positive vascular smooth muscle cells to the formation of the neointimal lesions, we used a transgenic mouse um, that when given tamoxifen um, induces a red fluorescent label in cells currently expressing NOTCH3. 
And again, in this mouse, all of the daughter cells will also express that fluorescent lineage label, whether or not they're still expressing NOTCH3. So tamoxifen um, administration resulted in labeling of a minority subset of medial smooth muscle cells, around 15%, when um, assessed three days after tamoxifen administration. We then put these mice into HDM, and the results demonstrated that the majority of neointimal cells carried that red NOTCH3 lineage label, meaning this minority subset of vascular smooth, mus mus um, vascular smooth muscle cells marked by NOTCH3 are the major cell of origin for the neointima. So the next question is, is NOTCH3 acting simply as a marker here, or are these cells using NOTCH pathway activity to accomplish artery remodeling? So to test this, we took advantage of the stereotype timing of remodeling in the model um, that I told you about earlier, and block NOTCH signaling during three two-week windows shown with these blue bars, uh, when the media thickens, when the neointima is established, and when the neointima lesions expand. And results demonstrated no difference in medial thickening when NOTCH was inhibited during that zero to two week uh, window of HGM exposure. However, in contrast, animals treated during uh, weeks two to four, when the neointima is established, show no um, little or no neointimal formation, indicating the transition from a medial smooth muscle cell to a neointimal cell occurs through a NOTCH dependent process. During the subsequent period of neointimal expansion, that four to six week um, HGM exposure window, notch blockade again had no effect, suggesting that the requirement for notch activity is confined to the short period of neointimal establishment, after which neointimal expansion is driven by other currently unknown mechanisms. So in summary of this work, um, we have an inflammation-driven mouse model that recapitulates many features of human pulmonary vascular disease, including the formation of occlusive vascular lesions. We have also found that in this model, the smooth muscle cells of healthy vessels generate both the thickened media and the neointimal lesions. In addition, there's a minority subset of vascular smooth muscle cells and healthy arteries marked by NOTCH3 that is the major cell of origin for the neointima. And NOTCH activity is required for a fate switch from a vascular smooth muscle cell to a neointimal cell, but not required for medial thickening or neointimal expansion. Okay, I'm going to pass this back to my class. Okay. Do presto changeo. Okay. So, <clears throat> says Leah foreshadowed, um, there are a number of outstanding questions that we would really like to answer. And these are the questions that the lab is currently working on. So I'm just gonna very briefly take you through um, two major areas of research that are ongoing in the lab. Um, and the first is trying to understand what is this neointimal growth signal that Leah very nicely outlined. We just don't know what it is, and we would obviously really like to understand because patients that um, show up in clinic they present with advanced disease after neointimal lesions are already present and where we want to be able to halt lesion progression or ideally even remodel back to a more healthy state. And so this is really one of the main research directions um, we're currently following in the lab, trying to understand what drives neointimal proliferation and expansion once it's formed. Okay, so the approach that we're taking has stemmed from the observation that, like in the healthy vascular smooth muscle cells, the neointima itself is both molecularly and behaviorally heterogeneous. So our first observation was that the proliferation in the neointima during the period of rapid lesion expansion between four and six weeks is dominantly among the neointimal cells that are in direct contact with the endothelium. So here you're looking at a kind of a funny section through sort of like an elbow of a bending artery. The neointima is here in green, and in red you see Ki67 positive proliferating cells. And you can see that the neointimal proliferating cells are directly adjacent to the endothelium, which is one out here that's not contacting an endothelial cell. And this ratio really holds up when you look across many, many sections. Um, it's about an 80-20 ratio. <clears throat> so similar... Oh. 
Similarly to the patterned proliferation, there's striking um, transcriptional heterogeneity within the neointima with a very strikingly similar geographic distribution of notch three positivity in the neointima to that of the proliferative subset. So <clears throat> the majority of the notch three positive neointimal cells are found directly adjacent to the endothelial endothelial layer. So here I'm showing you that by three different modalities. Um, on the left, we have um, protein localization with a notch three antibody. You can see the protein is in cells that are contacting the endothelium. Here by transcription, you can see notch three transcription is very strongly um, located adjacent to the endothelium. And then finally here in the right with that notch three CRE-ER that Leah introduced earlier, this is a CRE-ER that's driven by the endogenous regulatory elements of the notch three locus. Um, and it is similarly marking um, neointimal cells that are adjacent to the endothelium. <clears throat> um, and this is when tamoxifen rather was given, not at the beginning of the experiment as Leah showed you earlier, but rather after six weeks of dust mite had already been introduced to the animal, then it's given tamoxifen for a brief period, harvested three days later. So here we're not showing lineage, but rather where is Notch 3 being actively expressed in established neointimal lesions. Okay, so, and we also um, confirmed this pattern that we'd observed in the mouse model in human patient samples. So here in an IPAH lesion, um, again, you see that endothelial adjacent pattern of notch three transcription within the neointima, suggesting that in addition to the proliferative behavioral heterogeneity, we have very significant transcriptional heterogeneity in the cells that make up these lesions in both human and in the mouse model. So, <clears throat> When we use that notch three CRE-ER um, that marks those endothelial adjacent neointimal cells, and we lineage trace them now, here giving tamoxifen in early lesions, and here's the starting pattern on the left, and then allowing the lesions to continue to develop, we can see where these initially labeled cells, which cells they give rise to over that course of rapid lesion expansion. And you can see they give rise to the bulk of the neointimal lesions, um, of the bulk of the cells in the mature lesions, which is really very encouraging. It means we now have a molecular handle on the proliferative cells that are driving the growth of these lesions. <clears throat> and it suggests that that close contact between the endothelium and these proliferative cells suggests that continued signaling between endothelium and the neighboring neointima may be a driving factor in, um, in accelerating this proliferation. And we wanted to identify what those molecules might be, those endothelial molecules that might be mediating that signaling. And so <clears throat> for that, we turned to single cell RNA sequencing um, from both healthy and pH mice, including all of the smooth muscle lineages, the neointima, the endothelium, immune and fibroblast lineages. So all the cells that are in and around these arteries over the course of remodeling. And Leah, who did this work, took great care in annotating these cell clusters. So clustering them incredibly carefully and then validating her clusters by picking, identifying transcripts and combinations of transcripts, and then locating those transcripts back in intact tissue by in situ hybridization to really confirm that the clusters that we think they are actually are what we think they are in tissue. And so here um, we've got an example of how Leah's done that. Here's um, a group of um, transcripts that identify the neointimal cluster here along the top and other comparable um, other the transcripts in the in the dot plot here down along the bottom in other smooth muscle alpha actin positive um, clusters just for comparison and you can see in the red highlighted neointima this, there are transcript combinations that are unique to the neointimal cluster which you then went on to show um, in tissue really do identify neointima histologically so Leah's neointimal data set represents the very first comprehensive genomic description of neointimal cells. And digging into the gene expression in the neointima has been really interesting, and I think will be a very rich data set for future um, studies. But what we were most interested in using it for was to understand the nature of the signaling back and forth between endothelium and neointima and trying to identify those signals. So to do this in a thorough and unbiased way, 
Adam Andreska took Leah's data sets that she'd so beautifully annotated, and he used them to build these very clever interaction maps, which I'm showing you here. So the way that he does this is by making lists of genes that are differentially expressed between healthy and pH cells within a particular cell type cluster, and then filtering those lists for ligands and receptors and then mapping out the ligand producing sending cell clusters. Here, that's these colored boxes on the top of the diagram. And then <clears throat> um, connecting them to the receiving cell clusters, which are here shown at the bottom of the diagram. And these are the cells that express the cognate receptors of the ligands produced by the sending cells above. And so from this overall map, we can subset out interactions of interest, such as signals from arterial endothelium to the neighboring proliferative neointima. And this is a tractable list of candidates where expression can be validated in both mouse tissue and patient tissue, and top priority candidates can be functionally tested in vivo for a role in promoting um, or modulating neointimal growth. So let me take you through preliminary data from two of Leah's top priority candidates from this type of analysis. And these are the secreted inhibitors of Wnt signaling, um, SFRP1 and DKK2. Okay, so as you can see from this dot plot here in the upper right, both inhibitors highlighted in pink are robustly produced by, neo by um, healthy artery endothelium. So that's the top line here and their expression is largely lost in pH. That's the bottom line. So Leah confirmed in tissue um, by in situ hybridization below that um, both SFRP1 and DKK2 are present at high level in healthy artery endothelium and are both um, very strongly downregulated or completely lost in pH. And this led Leah to the hypothesis that loss of these secreted Wnt inhibitors when all the receptors and other machinery for Wnt signal transduction are present in the neointima, um, that this loss promotes neointimal growth by derepressing Wnt signaling in the neointima. And this led her to predict that Wnt blockade in vivo would slow or stop neointimal growth, which she went on to test in vivo. So here I'm quickly showing you what that in vivo testing um, looks like with a pharmacologic um, Wnt inhibitor. So here again, we're taking that staged pharmacology approach that Leah showed you before with the notch pathway. But here we're inhibiting Wnt signaling with a drug called um, C59. So C59 is a porcupine inhibitor. So <clears throat> porcupine is necessary for ligand secretion Wnt ligand secretion. And so in the absence of porcupine function, you have less ligand production and a diminution in Wnt signaling. And um, what we're doing is inhibiting during these three two-week windows. Um, here during the period where lesions are established, when that period of rapid lesion growth that we keep talking about. And then here, this is a new period we haven't really talked about, which is where at the start of the experiment at six weeks, the lesions are fully established big mature lesions. And then we're inhibiting during a period when mature lesions are just maintained if we keep up um, the dust mite exposure. Okay, so then on the bottom in this plot, um, what we're showing is neointimal lesion size on the y-axis <clears throat> and the percent of arteries containing neointimal lesions in the colored boxes below. Okay, so blue dots are arteries from vehicle exposed animals and red dots are arteries from C59 treated animals. And I hope you can see that at each stage, um, <clears throat> lesions are both smaller and less numerous following just two weeks of Wnt inhibition. And we even have evidence here in this final panel of lesion regression in these late stage animals, which we're extremely excited about. So Leah and a new fellow in lab, Jeff Nee, are now following up on this with the gold standard experiments of testing with tissue specific gain and loss of function of Wnt pathway components specifically within the growing neointimum. So we hope to update you on that soon. Okay, so another major question that we've set out to tackle is identifying the inflammatory drivers of artery remodeling and neointimal lesion formation. And this is Adam Andreska's project. So using broad lineage markers of different inflammatory populations on a time course of HDM tissue sections, Adam could show that the inflammatory cells in the perivascular space were dynamic. So the inflammation um, coalesces into these tight spheres of highly proliferative cells around the arteries. You can see here with the KI67 positivity surrounding veins and arteries, 
highlighted with asterisks and arrowheads. And Adam could then go on to show that those balls of proliferative inflammatory cells were in fact highly patterned tertiary lymphoid follicles with a B cell core and T cells around the periphery and where they're interlaced with this very delicate network of follicular dendritic cells shown here in this inset. So Adam wanted to more precisely characterize this changing inflammatory population, these changing populations over time in and around the arteries. And to do so, he turned to a spatial immunoprofiling technique called um, codex. So codex is essentially multiplexed immunostaining in which a single tissue section is incubated with dozens of barcoded primary antibodies that are sequentially imaged, resulting in cytoff level cell type identification while maintaining that crucial spatial resolution. So these multiplexed images are then segmented into individual cells, which can then be analyzed using standard cytoff pipelines, which is what I'm showing you here in um, the T-SNE plot in panel C. Um, <clears throat> and this then allows you to identify these, these fine lineage distinctions. And because each cell is associated with its original XY position, the cells in these T-SNE clusters can then be mapped back into histologic space, which is what's shown in D. And this then lets you quantitate which lineages are present within signaling distance in and around arteries at each of these specific stages of artery remodeling. And Adam found that the development of these T-cell rich um, lymphoid follicles tightly correlates with the development of the neointima. He was intrigued by the role of the T cells, and he went on to show that mice genetically lacking T cells are completely unable to make neointima, which further piqued his interest. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> and that then allowed him to return to his interaction maps, where he can now pull out the T cell derived signals, those are the signals here, and show which cells are receiving those signals, which are diagrammed out here. These are the receiving cells, I'm receiving which fraction of the T cell derived ligands. <clears throat> so here we're obviously very interested in so T cells do a lot of things. They both coordinate the overall perivascular inflammation, but they also um, are making direct signaling connections with the structural cells of the arteries themselves, with the smooth muscle, with the neointima, with the endothelium. And we're very interested in um, understanding the nature of those interactions. So <clears throat> Adam is validating those highest priority um, expression patterns in tissue, both in mouse and in patient samples, and he's testing their role in vivo, just as Leah and Jeff are doing with the Wnt pathway, which um, again, I'll highlight, I'll take you through as soon as we have data ready to share. But I think it's really important to note that these T cell rich lymphoid follicles um, are complex structures that need to be investigated um, as more than simply a source of secreted ligands, though they are a source of secreted ligands. Um, follicles perform a function. They're structurally adapted to facilitate um, local immune induction with local antigen presentation and local antibody production that can target both appropriate foreign antigens like HDM in this case, but are also very prone to generate autoantibodies that target nearby cells that are experiencing damage where their antigens can be um, brought inappropriately to the follicles for antibody generation. And this can then um, <clears throat> This can then lead to, to autoantibody production that will then further damage those, those already damaged cell types. So Adam is profiling the um, remarkably patterned clonal expansion of T cells over the course of artery remodeling, which is turning out to be very interesting. And he's identifying <clears throat> autoantibody production, quantitating it, figuring out when in the process it happens, and identifying the vascular targets of those antibodies to try to work out how immune cell function and not just ligands may also be playing a role in driving artery remodeling and pH. And so with that, rather than summing up our actual findings, because I think Leah did a really great job of doing that, um, what I'd like to leave you with is kind of just some of the things that we've learned in the process of carrying out these studies. And these are um, elements of our approach that have really worked for us and that we're going to capitalize on moving forward. So um, first, the, we've learned that mapping, taking the time to really understand the basis of the process that you're studying, studying, mapping the key steps and the cell dynamics in the system with lineage tracing, 
by mapping single cell behaviors using spatially resolved immunoprofiling. That's the basis of everything else, all the other experiments that you, that you do subsequently. And we've really found that to be well worth our time. And the second is, at least in our system, heterogeneity really matters. Um, in pH, it's turned out that cryptic subpopulations have driven key steps, two key steps at least, in um, lesion, expan in lesion um, initiation and then in neo-intimal lesion expansion, that, that growth phase. And if we'd done all of our work at a population level, rather than by paying attention to the heterogeneity within each of those populations, we would have totally missed those findings. Then finally, and this is really kind of an elaboration of what I just said, single cell RNA sequencing is tremendously valuable and the interaction mapping that we've been able to derive from those single cell data sets has really been instrumental in helping us take kind of a global approach to understanding um, how these processes that we've defined, how those processes are regulated. And finally, having a quantitative in vivo functional assay where you can go in and actually test things, twiddle the knobs and see what are the things that your databases are predicting will have a function. Do those things actually have the function that you think they have? And that's been absolutely essential in helping us um, figure out which, um, which elements of our, of our analysis are, are really matter when the rubber meets the road. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's done this work, um, Leah, of course, <laughs> as well as Jeff in the lab, Alexis, Maddie, and Amajindi, who've all been absolutely instrumental in getting this work done. Our collaborators um, at Stanford um, in the Metzger lab, and then very notably in Etta Speaker-Cotter's lab in the adult pulmonary division, especially Adam Andreska, who's um, an instructor in um, the Department of Medicine. Um, and we'd also like to thank our division chief, David Cornfield, who's been tremendously supportive and all of our um, funding agencies um, and very notably the MCHRI, which were early and very enthusiastic supporters of this work and without which none of this would have um, gotten done. So we're, we're tremendously grateful. All right, and with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful talk. I've heard you guys talk so many times, but every time I learn something new and I think you guys <laughs> do such a great job breaking down a complex disease and also some complex data and making it really um, digestible, which is wonderful. You guys have a couple questions that have come in. Um, first, um, can you discuss the house dust mite model in relation to PAH? Does it suggest PAH is allergic and involves mast cells slash allergy associated immune arm? Do you want to take this or do you want me to do it? <laughs> All right, so no, I don't think PAH is an allergic disease at all. I think that the um, HDM exposure is just a way of kind of driving a chronic inflammatory perivascular response. And that what it says is that the perivascular inflammation in PAH, I think is really important to um, generating the uh, artery phenotype that's driving the disease. So I think in the human though, it's not driven by inhaled exposure. I think it's driven by, by other features, whether those are endothelial damage in the case of congenital heart disease, or um, inflammatory processes in the case of scleroderma associated PAH or you know, any number of things, drug and toxin exposure. I think you just kind of need to trigger this inflammation and then you begin a process that um, is what we're studying here. I think there are many roads into this central process and that's how we think about it. Great. Um... Our next, the next question is about um, the neo, is the neo-intimal cell really neo or is it seen during development or in um, disease in another context? Yeah, so um, it's definitely seen in other, in other diseases, um, <laughs> in other vascular beds, um, the cerebral vascular bed, the systemic vascular bed, the ones that come to mind are, um, atherosclerotic lesions are definitely made up of occlusive neointimal cells um, and heterogeneity, um, different features of heterogeneity have been described in those neointimal cells from atherosclerotic lesions. And in some other work that we've done kind of parallel to this work, we've also 
um, been encouraged by reviewers to compare and contrast the similarities between the neointimal lesions we see in the pulmonary vascular bed, um, as well as in the systemic um, atherosclerotic lesions. Um, and there is some overlap of similarities, um, but there is definitely kind of different markers uh, between the two systemic beds. Um, as far as um, as I know, there's there's no presence of neointimal occlusive lesions within the developing vasculature. It's not, you know, kind of a a, a lumen formation process where the neointimal lesions disappear during development. Obviously, Maya is the vascular developmental biologist, <laughs> um, but she's nodding ahead, her head uh, as I speak. So, um, not not present in the developing uh, human lung, uh, but definitely present in other um, vascular beds throughout the body in disease. Yeah, so the way that the walls of the arteries form in the lung developmentally is you have first an endothelium, and that endothelium then calls in neighboring fibroblast progenitors that will make the vascular smooth muscle in this kind of radial construction. Um, and there's no stage at which those smooth muscle cells are inside the elastin layer that normal that separates the smooth muscle layer from the endothelium. And that when, when, when you make a neo, and I, maybe we didn't explain this super, super clearly, but when you make neointima, the histologic definition of neointima is that it's inside, the, the smooth muscle is normally bounded by this jacket of um, elastin on the outside and then elastin on the inside. So it's sort of like, two elastin slices of bread with smooth muscle in between and then endothelium on the inside. And when neointima forms, you break that elastic lamina, the interior one, and smooth muscle goes in and, and seeds the neointima and expands from there. And there's nothing like that in normal development. Oh, cool. All right, so um, the next question is related to C59. And I'm gonna add a question of my own onto that. Is C59 a drug that's either used in humans or potentially could be? And then, uh, but the question from our um, attendee is would inhaled C59 work better than systemic for PAH? Yeah, I mean, getting away from truly global exposure, <laughs> I think is, is obviously a good thing. I mean, and especially with the notch inhibition that Leah took you through, I mean, like you do not want to globally inhibit notch. This is not a happy state of life. Um, you want to be able to target any notch inhibition directly to the pulmonary vasculature. So like maybe inhaled would be a good way to do that. I know inhaled um, trials are definitely underway for other modulators in the pH world. So imatinib is something that, um, again, mediates um, endothelial vascular, endothelial smooth muscle signaling in the pulmonary vasculature. And um, sorry, imatinib is an inhibitor of PDGF um, signaling, which is one of those um, pathways that uh, mediates crosstalk between those two cell types. And there were global imatinib trials that were um, very promising because they had uh, very like initially promising results, but there were all these totally confounding and tragic side effects to global inhibition. And so those trials were halted despite those early promising results with um, helping with pulmonary hemodynamics. And so now they've reinitiated those trials with an inhaled version of imatinib. And maybe that is gonna be a way to go for, for many different drugs, maybe C59, maybe better modulators of wind signaling. Are there any wind signaling or inhibition molecules that are used in humans for other diseases or anything right now? Oh God, I should know the answer to this. I, I feel like there must be, but I truly don't know. <laughs> This is, that's very embarrassing that I don't know. I, I don't know. I should look it up. I will look it up as soon as we're off. This okay. I haven't heard of any either, but I thought it was interesting. I mean, it's, it's a clear modulator in many, in many cancers. So colorectal I, cancer. yeah, colorectal cancer, it's just, there's a lot of reasons to develop said modulators. I, I don't know if they exist though. I, I don't know if they're treating humans with them. That's okay. Um, and we have one more question from Dr. Oro. Uh, some inhalants are associated with cancer, not pH. Is that due to the response or the neointimal cell type? Some inhalants, like you get a, an inhaled, like asbestos or something that leads to cancer. Is that what you mean, Tony? If you can hear me, feel free to feel free to pipe up if I've misunderstood. Um, let's see. So some inhalants are associated with cancer and not pH. Is that due to the response or neointimal cells type? I think I don't understand the question. Do you understand the question? 
maybe it's just um, moving toward this kind of abnormal proliferative cell type that occurs ah. post in inhalatory yeah. injury. I see, I see. So like an, an, an inhaled allergen doesn't do this in, in many, in, in humans, it leads to other effects. And why is it doing it in mice? Yeah, yeah, this is Tony. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, like uh, chronic inflammation can be, can be upregulating hedgehog signaling and that's associated with lung, with non, non, like different kinds of lung cancer in the, you know, predisposed um, epithelium. So what, what's happening here that's- Right, why with, is it so different in these mice? Yeah, like with, yeah, with yeah. scleroderma and with with you know pH, but then there's also this cancer response. So why is, it seems like the microenvironment is is responding differently with the different environmental stimulus? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, so one thing is, I think, and this kind of gets back to the whole: um, can we think of pH as an allergic disease in humans? And why I don't think that that's what we can conclude from this at all. Um, it gets back to that question as well. So like when, when humans inhale allergens, they get chronic bronchial inflammation, right? And that inflammation is really um, held within the airway and it doesn't spill out to the perivascular space, even though they're very closely associated arteries, right? The arteries don't aren't surrounded by inflammation. Whereas in mice, they don't seem to be able to contain the inflammation in the way that the human lung can. And so even after very short periods of inhaled allergen exposure, the inflammation is really around veins and arteries in a way that, I mean, I don't quite understand the direction, like what, what, what um, controls why the inflammation becomes perivascular as opposed to peribronchial. Um, in humans, and maybe I'm getting off target, so drag me back, drag me back if I'm not answering your question, but in humans where the inflammation really is contained within the airway, there are vessels within the airway wall, right? The bronchial circulation is, is in the airway wall feeding the, the cells of the actual airway. And in humans with very chronic asthma, if you look at those vessels, those bronchial vessels that are bathed in inflammation over a period of years, they undergo exactly the process that we're seeing here in the pulmonary arteries in mice. I think this is just what arteries do when they're surrounded with inflammation over a period of time. And so I think this is a core process. It just, it manifests differently in the different species because of how the species kind of are able to distribute the inflammation or, or block its distribution. But doesn't that, um, doesn't that argue that, that it really is, um, that, pe that pulmonary hypertension really is an allergic response. It's just that the, the human structural, um, the way it's, it's structured just, you have to do a lot more chronic inflammation to get to a point whereas in the mouse it's a little bit easier. Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably just using our words differently and agreeing with each other. So I think it's a, it's a response yeah. to chronic inflammation around the vessel. So in humans, if you have chronic inflammation around the vessel, like in the airway wall of a chronic asthmatic, you get this response, but it just doesn't matter that much to the health of the person that their bronchial vessels are occluded. It really matters if your pulmonary vessels are occluded. And with chronic allergic inflammation in humans, um, you, the inflammation just doesn't ever really see the pulmonary arteries. It only sees the bronchial arteries. Yeah. So um, I think that's the difference. And that there are other ways, non-allergic ways to trigger the inflammation around the pulmonary arteries in, in humans. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that's why I'm shying away from the word allergic, but I do think inflammation is absolutely central. Great. Um... I'll ask one more question. I don't see any others that have come through. Um, from the standpoint of the, you know, the diseases that we think of in Pete's poem being at risk for pH, you know, the BPD and uh, other congenital cardiac disease, do you think there's there could be a role for using a drug like C59 or some other kind of WIN inhibitor to prevent the development of pulmonary hypertension? Prevent. I mean. Yeah, the question, big hammer. <laughs> the question has also come up um, with even the notch, right? Because we, we state that the notch in, inhibiting the development of neointima is not that clinically useful because patients present um, after kind of disease has developed. But in these populations where you are worried about disease development, could you implement some degree of signaling inhibition early to prevent progression. Um, I think the issue that we come across when we think about these things, especially, I keep pointing back to the developmental biologist, but all of these pathways are so integral 
in vessel development that when my mind goes to the preemie population to begin with, you don't want to inhibit notch signaling in the developing lung, right? And, and we know that in humans, even alveolarization and capillary formation occurs, especially in a preterm infant, you know, for out, X, U, X, X, outside of the uterus uh, for um, a long time. So I would be very wary to inhibit notch in that population uh, because I think it could have significant detrimental side effects on um, ongoing necessary vessel development. Especially in a kid that isn't yet manifesting disease where you're just worried. I mean, you have to have a pretty, pretty low side effect treatment before you would take such a route, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then make them think how much you need, but you know, you, you don't want to overshoot those sorts of pro proliferative or anti proliferative signals, you know, it's kind of finding that sweet spot um, for both of those signaling pathways too. Sure, makes sense. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come in. Um, I do have one more thing to, to kind of announce on behalf of MCHRI. So um, I mentioned our next uh, seminars and, but I want to point out that our one in January on Tuesday, January 10th, will be in person. So um, that one will not be on Zoom, but will be in person. So please come and uh, learn about um, detection, diagnosis of undiagnosed disease. <laughs> but thank you so much, um, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Steph. It was a wonderful talk, very engaging. You can tell by just the questions afterwards how engaged everybody was. So thank you and have a nice day. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>